Hi everybody, this is Liam from Running Remote and in today's video, we have someone extra special. We have my friend Addy, who is uh, South African and he is a human being and he is running a two-time remote first company. The first company was Woo Themes and the second company now Conversio and he's also a speaker at Running Remote. So we're both in Toronto today because we work remotely, we can travel the world and we can do these types of things. So I thought to myself, why don't I actually get a sit down with Addy and talk to him about something that I think he can uniquely speak to, which is remote company culture. We discussed this a little bit before this video, but I mean, what does remote culture and culture in general mean to you? Yeah, I mean, Froji, thank you for having me, Liam. Um, don't know about the extra special bit. I mean, that's always interesting when someone introduces me like that. Um, I think, you know, kind of the first thing when I think about culture, so kind of going back 12 odd years now, kind of with themes, I started with themes when I was literally started out of varsity, right? Mm -hmm. And culture was not something that I knew anything about. And as we kind of grew with themes back in the day and kind of getting into Conversio subsequent to that, what I basically learned was like culture is gonna to happen to you and your team regardless of what you do with it. Like it is there. So you almost have this choice of like, what kind of, are you gonna influence this? Like, are you gonna craft it and evolve it over time? Or are you just gonna have it be there? But it's always gonna be there. Mm -hmm. And you know, in that sense, kind of culture is literally just kind of the protocol about how you're kind of working and talking internally. Mm -hmm. But I think definitely that kind of, you know, spills over into customer conversations, marketing, kind of how you do sales, how you build a product, kind of all those things, because the way you think about the world is kind of, that's what that reflects, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, my definition of culture is, what do you do that would appear weird or odd to others? So everyone wears clothes, that doesn't necessarily seem odd to anyone, but maybe we all decide to wear uh, shorts in February, as an example, which would be quite odd. So for Conversio, and maybe in Woo Themes as well, what are a couple examples of interesting cultural points that would appear odd to other people? Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I like that the kind of odd bit, right? Because you can almost take the, the oddness and you can turn it into some kind of, um, you know, competitive it's advantage, fun. right? Yeah. It's fun internally, but like I think like being different is great, right? I mean, the most markets that you can enter these days are saturated. So, you know, being able to say like, this is who we are, this is how we think and this is what we do. Like there's differentiation there. Um, I mean, I guess with Woo Themes, like Woo Themes had a fun brand to it. Like, I mean, the, the mascot was a ninja. Um, and like not knowing what culture was, what I now know is what happened is, you know, my co-founders, Magnus, Mark and I, um, like we, we were big drinkers. We were also young, so it was much easier to metabolize all the alcohol that we were having. But what happened was like on team meetings, whenever we'd meet up, we were the cheerleaders in that regard. And I mean, I, I, I don't think there was any bad behavior from it, but thinking back, like it was also, that could not have been a benefit, right? I mean, so like, I think if, May, like that made us different to other teams probably that that was a significant thing about our culture like mm -hmm. a bit of a boozy culture mm -hmm. um, but I don't think there was any benefit kind of from that um, except for the fact that the team members that liked to partake they obviously had some fun right, right? Um, and we had I mean obviously there's great stories to share right and I think these great stories we did manage to massage them in some way where we could create this idea to the outside world that this is a fun place to work, right? right. So, I mean, there is that as well, but it, I don't think it, that had much kind of substance. Mm -hmm. um, moving to Conversio, like it was also literally kind of more of a grown up thing, right? Mm -hmm. kind of, you, I think you go like from the one business to the next, and I definitely kind of, I, I had this list of things like, listen, you know, these are things that I don't want to do again. These are things that I want to kind of do. Can you go over that list? I'm very interested. What, what's the do not do list? <laughs> Um, or any, um, did any jump, any of them jump out yeah, at you that you so, can talk about so, right so, now? So, so two things that I can remember like very, very clearly is the one, like my exit from Woo Themes was, was tricky. Mm -hmm. Like Magnus, Mark and I ended up fighting. Yep. Like we're friends now. It took us two years after the exit. Yep. 
Um, but one of them at that stage, because I was angry as hell, was I will not have a co-founder again, right? So I'm solo founder in Converjo. Um, and in brutal honesty, like that's something I actually miss today. I actually miss having a co-founder. Um, so that was the one. Um, but the other one, and can I begin saying this now and relates to culture, was I wanted to build a team sooner. So I think kind of through the growth stages of We Themes, our ability to grow a team, like we were, there were people doing things, but still like there's still things that just needed to be escalated to me right so not necessarily em empowering a team member to actually do something to an extent that i didn't have to worry about it right so uh, those i mean those are two things that kind of you know really really stand out um i think the other thing kind of what was interesting for me as well is we themes had a hybrid model in terms of remote work so we had a cape town office that housed about 10 of us mm -hmm. um and when i left the ceo in mid 2013 we we're about 35 people the rest were all scattered. And with Converger, the idea was that this should totally be remote. I mm -hmm. think there's definitely challenges in terms of the hybrid model, like communication. It's so much easier, like when, you know, when the default in a remote team is when we talk, like this either happens in a kind of Zoom call where everyone is at, or I, you, know, you and I are talking and this needs to go to a base camp thread for everyone else to see. When you're in office and you and I have, like I walk over to your desk and we mm -hmm. have a quick power, I'll make a decision. Yeah. The rest of the team possibly loses the context because either you or me don't have the discipline right. to remember that hey we should be posting this kind of online yes so but yeah i've been thinking back i mean it's been ages now about six years i know the um the hybrid model i mean this is a one of the general debates that are now popping out about remote work in general uh people like joel from buffer uh amir from doist who are the people that i've had direct conversations about they've been saying about the long-term dangers of the hybrid model because you also end up having a founder team or an executive team that ends up becoming the core and then you have what they call second class workers right employees inside of the company that just they work in india as an example but they don't really get that same level of interaction and if you want to get that level of interaction you actually have to move to that place so it's forcing those people to centralize, which is really problematic if you're going to commit to the remote first model. And I know for us, it's one of those things that is even a challenge for me right now because we have a small office where I'm located. We have a couple other small offices as well. And I do see the employees, the workers that are close to me, I interact with them differently. I obviously interact with them more. Uh, we even had a moment where we said, oh, well, it's stupid for us to all do our our calls, our video calls on separate computers. But I said, no, we have to, because that's what we're talking about is everyone is equal and coming into the same place. If they see us all as a little group together, then it doesn't then communicate that remote first model. And it starts to, long, long term, it's definitely damages that culture. Uh, so something that is, it, it works very slowly inside of an organization and you don't notice it happening before it actually becomes a big problem that you need to kind of nip in the bud. I mean, that's, that's interesting. I mean, a very small data set, right? But with Moo Themes, the retention in the office was better than the remote retention. And I don't think that was a remote issue. I don't think it was the individuals that were remote. I think it was because the local team, the, the office-based team, like we could do fun stuff. Like if we wanted to grab beers on a Friday, because we had this boozy culture, right? right? If we want to grab beer as a team, like we could do that. Whereas the rest of the team that were based all around the world, they didn't have that benefit, right? right. Um, so I'm very much in favor of like, if you're remote, like just do remote properly, which in my mind is do not have an office. Um, I also think in terms of like culturally that's equal, right? Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, second class is maybe not the way I would describe it, but I understand like there's differences. You're basically saying like, because you're just because you're here, and you have access to an office, you're going to have a different experience within our team than someone that is kind of that someone that is in remote, which actually makes it much harder for you to align everyone around a shared vision, mission, culture, values, right? Because they are different. Like there's 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 nothing. There's no amount of intellectualizing I think you can do mm. to make them equal again. They yes. are just different. Right. So, I mean, let's touch on that a little bit more. When you switched from Woo Themes to Conversio, what were some other things that you did from a cultural perspective that 
you realized were mistakes in the first iteration and you've now, or at least are trying to fix with Conversio at this point? Yeah, I mean, I, and I think the kind of, um, the disclaimer here is like I, the little bit I know about culture is the little bit that is written about it that I've been able to read and through experience, right? So, and I think in that sense, probably the best thing I did from with you know, with teams to Conversio was just this awareness around culture, right? So even before I hired the first team members, I wrote out a value statement. I think it was eight things on the list, mm -hmm. right? That were just things that were prevalent and relevant for me at the time, right? But I had the first, I think, three or four team members that joined, they had to agree to this kind right. of value statement, right? And that's evolved kind of you know, over time now. I mean, we went through multiple iterations as the team grew and as we got to know more about us as a business, us as a company, us as a team. But I think that, that was the first thing, like literally just like, there has to be some kind of you know, line in the sand saying, we are like for us to grow as a business and team, we are going to have to have these shared values mm -hmm. and the values can as it evolve over time, but they need to be there. Right. So I think that was the kind of your first thing. Um, but beyond that, when I think about culture, it always feels so like grandiose. Right. Yeah. It, it feels like you have to have a, I, I, dude, I don't even know what the difference it between feels very crunchy granola. When you hear the word culture, it's like, OK, Let's just put that aside for a second. Let's make money in the business and then we can deal with culture. I always felt like that was a secondary, third, fourth concern. And it is, so I actually am two sides about this. I believe that culture is absolutely important. But if the business isn't working, like if the dollars and cents of the business isn't working, then forget, like, let's make money first and deal with culture second. Yeah. Uh, and I think we kind of, at least for us in our personal experience, we experienced both sides of that. I was initially quite against the concept of culture. And I was like, the point of the business is to make money and make our customers happy. That's the point of the business, mm -hmm. not this higher level kind of mission statement that everyone can get behind. But then a couple of years ago, ironically, when we actually started making more money than we really needed, like once we got to a point in which I was like, wow, we're, we're this big, we're making this much. Then I was like, I'm getting a little bored about like now that there's no grind left on this goal, which was a monetary goal. Then I was like, how can we reorganize the goal to something that I'm a lot more passionate about? And for us, it was empowering people to work wherever they want, whenever they want. So if we can empower everyone to have that opportunity on planet Earth, which is in essence an unachievable goal, and I think I actually, I wanted that goal because it's unachievable, so I'll always feel like I'm grinding towards it. There's never, it's like the uh, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, right? The, I don't know if you've seen that documentary, but a guy that makes the rice for 20 years for his master, who's a sushi master, and every single day he would throw it out until 17 years into making the rice, he said it's good enough. And the man just cried, right? But once the master said the rice is good enough, then he was like, where do I go next? I've achieved this massive goal, which you think is quite simple making rice in the morning, but always having that, that grind allowed me at least to be able to say, okay, let's forget about necessarily the money right now. What can we do? How can we make people's lives a little bit better. Yeah. Giving them remote work opportunities makes them better. How can we get everyone on planet Earth to have that type of opportunity? Which has now given me an alignment that I never really understood until, because everyone talks about this, this culture terminology, but then once we got there, or I got there, I got it. Uh, which was, for people that are watching right now, if you haven't gotten it, it's very exciting when you do get it, because you get a lot more excited about the business. Um, but did you have any cut ton of moment like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I guess the truth here is that um, I, I had a conversation with a friend yesterday and he called me a mercenary. And he said, because he was a missionary, and he's in biotech and he's totally going to change people's lives, right? Yeah. And I said, like, dude, that, like, that's a little harsh, right? I, I'm no mercenary. He said, but no, dude, you, you like the game of business, which is not untrue, right? right? The reality is, like, I, like, we build marketing software that probably at least helps consumerism, which I philosophically don't believe in, okay. right? 
So I too had to have that thing, that other thing that created meaning and like beyond the monetary side of things, right? Mm -hmm. Had to create this other thing that had this meaning. And a big part for me, at least from going from Woo Themes to Converso, was this fact that as a founder in Woo Themes, which was wildly successful, especially at a young age for me, mm -hmm. it, it allowed me to live my life in a certain way. Um, and I wanted to, if I could replicate part of that and I could enable my team to have parts of that, that would be great, right? Mm -hmm. So I know, for example, you know, with both, of, like the birth of both of our kids, I mean, my wife has her own business, but we were financially stable and secure enough that she was not forced to go back to work until she was happy to do so, right? Right, And even just that flexibility in space is something that most employees never have, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of meaning is kind of a big part of what I hope to do within Converger, right? And to the extent today, like if you go to our about page, like the only, again, like I'm no expert in trying to you know, codify or define or explain our culture, but we at least start with, hey, we're family and life first. Mm. We want to do challenging and exciting work mm -hmm. that is profitable, right? Mm -hmm. Because it has to be profitable for us to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. But ultimately we believe in like, that should support having meaningful, meaningful experience outside of work, right? So I agree, like that's, and that's something, you know, that excites me much, much more than tapping into a new customer acquisition channel and figuring out how to grow revenue by 10%. That's part of the challenge, right? That's- the not bad though. Yeah, I mean, again, <laughs> totally. Like, and I don't think it's either or, right? I right. mean, I, I truly believe like you have to come from a profitable, like the business has to be sustainable for us to explore and experiment with these meaningful things around culture. Um, but if you ask me, like, gun to my head, which I get more excited about, it is not the business part, right? It is this other part of it. Like, what does this, this thing mean to the people whose lives this touches? Got it. I'd also love to be able to touch on, and I know that this is almost a separate video, but I, I'm getting a little bit inspired because we talk about this quite a bit. Where do you see the future of remote work? Where do you see remote work in 10 years as an example of where we are right now? Some interesting statistics. Um, the last three years, we've gone from 1% of the United States working full-time remotely, then to 3% and now to 5%. And there's a couple uh, think tanks, the biggest one saying that they expect 50% of the US workforce that can work remotely will work remotely by 2027. And that's almost a number that I can't calculate in my own mind because that means a complete shift of the way that we do labor on planet Earth and more specifically the United States, which is definitely the most important market for remote work. So how do you see the, because you've been in remote work for quite a while, right? You were one of the OGs of remote work. How have you seen the evolution over the last 10 years? And then what do you see uh, possibly happening over the next 10 years? So I, oh, controversial. I, I, I mean, the market- is great, let's do it. <laughs> so the market is obviously gonna grow, right? Relative to where it is today. Yes. Like you're gonna see more and more businesses that are open to hiring remote workers um, and more people just open to it, mm -hmm. right? To, to wanting to work remotely, right? So in absolute size, I think the market is gonna grow. Mm -hmm. Whether we're gonna cross that threshold where like more than half of all people that can do it will do it, I'm not that optimistic, right? Mm -hmm. um, for, and that's probably a bigger conversation. I mean, I think- If you had a gut feel, because so everyone talks about how gut feels are, are, are no good, but they're actually really great, particularly for people that have had their 10,000 hours inside of the domain that they're thinking about usually a gut feel for someone that's been in the space for such a long time is a good perspective. 10 years from now, what percentage of the US uh, workforce do you think would be working remotely? 10 years, I mean, what's the percentage now? It's 5% right now. 15 to 20%. 15 to 20%, yeah. okay. So, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, I, I think one of the kind of variables that kind of greatly concerns me mm -hmm. is, AI and just the robotization of everything, right? right? Like that is concerning. Right. Um, and you ultimately still like the, the, the biggest of companies. I call AI the rise of the plumbers. Yeah. How Please do you, do. Sure. how do you, uh, 
like what jobs are left. Yeah. Get into plumbing. Plumbing's great. Do electrical, construction, like physical jobs that until you have androids that are actually able to do that type of work, you're going to have a situation where those types of jobs are really the jobs, you know, when you look at medicine, law, accounting, some of the most expensive positions in the workforce today, those are the ones that AI are going to get rid of first. Yeah because they're incredibly profitable to get rid of and replace with an AI. And we already see this today. Um, you know, even in us dealing with SaaS businesses, we have a unique perspective on AI that not many other people are able to get access to. And I'm personally excited, and I think the definition of excited for me is it could be terrifying. But there's going to be a huge change in the way that we do work. And there's this remote work movement that's occurring, but then AI could literally replace all drivers, which is about 12% of the US workforce instantaneously. So it's, a, it's an interesting movement that we've got going on right now. And I think that it's something that when you look at artificial intelligence, I mean, do you think that there will be a point where these remote workers, some people have actually suggested that remote work is kind of the vanguard for AI, meaning people are not working in person. And then this next stage is they're working digitally. They're still a human being, but they're disconnected and you connect with them through a computer. And then by extension, it makes it easier to be able to actually replace that person with, a, with an AI versus when they're when Suzanne's in the office making coffee. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you consider like the early stage of remote work was literally like hiring a cheap VA in the Philippines, yep. right? It's it's basically an anonymous person. Mm -hmm. You don't ever have a, you know a video call with them, right? Um, replacing them is super easy, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're they're disposable in right. the worst kind of way, right? Yep. Um, so I actually think what is interesting is for me, remote work might, might actually way to save us here, mm. right? Because let's face it, the the most greedy corporates would want to robotize as much as possible, right? Because they can probably do so at scale and at great profit, right? And we all know like uh, human capital is always the, the most expensive part in a business. Mm -hmm. It's also the most unpredictable part in a business, yes. right? So if we say, if we make the man in that sense, kind of the big corporates, I think remote work and especially, because remote, what, what's the base of remote work? Remote work takes power back to the individual to decide, this is how I want to live my life. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, there's two contrary or contradictory um, philosophies there, right? And a rise in remote work and uh, as part of that, you need entrepreneurs and businesses that value that mm -hmm. is probably a way to fight back part of this right. to say listen here yes we might not be the next kind of you know unicorn that can list because we are losing out in scale against these big companies but what we value more is the humans involved mm. in this um and that sounds massively philosophical I, yes like but if you're you, losing some of the non-crunchy granola people in the audience, but you know what? I, like, I love that concept, but then I think to myself, what is, it's a, per, it's a classic tragedy of the commons problem. So in philosophy, they have this concept called tragedy of commons, which is if everyone has a common land, no one is responsible individually for protecting that land. So everyone can just take their little bit and they're not damaging the whole because everyone else is doing it, but then how do you stop that process? from happening. I am having this exact thought process for artificial intelligence, which is inside of our software companies, we're all building AIs. And to be honest with you, I would love a government to be able to stop me from doing that, to be able to force me to get a license, to be able to do it in an ethical way. But unfortunately, that's not the way it works. And if I do it in an ethical way, I would be, or generally an ethical way, there's someone else who will do it in an unethical way that will push me out of the market. So then I'm in a really difficult position where, well, do I build it to be competitive in the market or do I build it based off my ethics? Yeah. So, and you know what, with Conversio, we've always had this thing around kindness. And again, we build marketing software, right? right? So, but we've been kind, like there's aggressive tools that our competitors have that we don't have. Our pricing is better. None of that's been a competitive advantage. In fact, we recently made some changes to the way we market and promote ourselves 
closer to our competitors and suddenly our revenue went like that as well. So, and that's unfortunate, right? Like, because that, that, that takes a bit of that um, kind of the, the impetus around like, how can we contribute at least in a small part to change in the world when the people that should, should benefit from this ultimately are not willing to pay for it. Mm. And this is cheaper, right? I'm, mm. not, I'm not asking you to necessarily buy kind of a Patagonia sweater that right. might be three times what you can pay for, you know, a similar you know, brand, but don't have the durability, for example, right? right? We're actually cheaper as well and kinder, yet people don't seem to care for that. Mm -hmm. um, that's hard. Right. Does the market care? No, it does not. Does the world care? Probably not. I, if I'm going to be completely, totally honest and, uh -huh. and harsh, like, but do you feel, can you sleep better at night? For sure. That's the thing, you know what, and, and I think, you know, uh, before we, like, we should totally put a disclaimer on this video, by the way, beforehand, that viewers should get a, you know, a whiskey or something beforehand, <laughs> like, that will take the edge off for them. Uh -huh. But to come back, like, for me, the way I, I at least feel about it, and I will, like, in a roundabout way, come back to culture, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I am very ambitious. I would not necessarily kind of be a change maker in the world. I'm not that grandiose. Mm -hmm. I would like to touch more people's lives. I would like to do something meaningful. What I've realized though is I have 13 other people on my team. Mm -hmm. And if I can just do a small thing with my business that enhances their lives, mm -hmm. that's the first step. And that's probably the first thir you know, 13 boxes checked. Got it. Right? Yeah. So like I, I ultimately can't, like if, we, if that messaging, if our messaging gets out there mm -hmm. and other employers adopt more of a kind of life and family first culture, that's amazing, mm -hmm. right? If that stops the robots from taking over, that's even better, right? But I can't necessarily take responsibility for that. And I don't think, I don't think it's necessary either that we need to optimize for that or define our success in that way. Mm. So for anyone that's uh, really interested in learning more about a kinder and happier uh, marketing tool and email service provider, where would they find Conversio? Yeah, I mean, the, the easiest thing from here is to check out our YouTube channel, right? Okay. I'm totally targeting ads, by the way, sorry. Yeah. Like, um, so YouTube channel, um, otherwise, Conversio.com is our website, yeah. or my personal blog where I write weekly, um, 80.me. Yeah, and even better, um, if you're going to be in Bali for running remote, You'll also be able to get Adi, who's going to be giving a fantastic presentation specifically on company culture in his journey, which I'm really excited. I'm even more excited to be able to watch it now because, you know, this is kind of like a teaser for that, for that experience. So thanks for having me on. Or, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we should put this on your YouTube channel. Uh, no, so thanks for coming on. Uh, with me and if anyone has any other questions for Addy, uh, post them down in the comments below and we'll probably be able to get Addy in here to be able to answer them for you. And if you really liked this video and you think this is a little bit different from the regular videos that I do, uh, it's kind of like, I don't think we're going to do this one like super jump cutty because this doesn't feel like a jump cutty video. I like it. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you don't like the video, give it a thumbs down just so that I can kind of figure out what you guys are looking for um, in terms of content. And maybe it's a whole thumbs down. I actually, like, just like you were saying, maybe the more aggressive ones make more money, right? But maybe I don't like them as much, you know? We'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. definitely see, we'll see, we'll see what what the stats are right now so thanks for having me and uh we'll see you in the next video